There's a lot going on right now. And so I've made the decision to switch up our programming this week. Our show is syndicated in 194 countries. And right now there is a lot of conflict going on in regions around the world. And there has never been a better time to provide tools that will help you tap back into the power and light and love and connection inside of you. And Dr. Tama is the person who can teach you how to do it. Hey, it's your friend Mel and welcome to the Mel Robbins podcast. There's a lot going on right now. And so I've made the decision to switch up our programming this week and rerun an episode that we did back in May that was called Six Signs You're Disconnected from Your Power and How to Get It Back, Life-Changing Advice from the Remarkable Dr. Tama Bryant. Now that episode was extraordinary. It's been one of our most shared episodes since launching the Mel Robbins podcast and in it, Dr. Tama Bryant, who is literally a walking treasure of a human being. She is discussing in this episode the process of homecoming which is how you overcome fear and trauma to reclaim your whole authentic self. Her book, Homecoming, which is now out in paperback, is a must read. And as far as I'm concerned, this conversation with Dr. Tama was one of the most important conversations we've had in the first year of the Mel Robbins podcast. The reason why I'm replaying it right now is because I think you need to hear it. There are so many tools that will help you tap back into the power and light and love and connection inside of you. And I decided to re-release this episode because I think the world really would benefit from listening to this. Our show is syndicated in 194 countries, and right now there is a lot of conflict going on in regions around the world. And there has never been a better time to provide tools and hope and small ways that you as an individual can empower yourself and live in the truth and also stay connected to light and to love and to connection. And Dr. Tama is the person who can teach you how to do it. She's a psychologist, a minister, a tenured professor at Pepperdine University. She's a New York Times bestselling author. In 2023, she was named the very first black female president of the American Psychological Association. She completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Duke University and her postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School's Victims of Violence program. She says that no matter what's going on around you, you can always come back home to yourself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The six signs that you're disconnected from yourself. And most importantly, how you can start to reconnect. I hope you love this conversation as much as I did. I just re-listened to it, and I know it's exactly what you need right now. Dr. Tama Bryant's brand new book, Homecoming, Overcome Fear and Trauma to Reclaim Your Whole Authentic Self. It is a must read. Dr. Tama, I am so thrilled that you are here. I am thrilled to be here. I love you. I love your work. And I love getting the word out about the journey home because we need it. Oh, do we ever? You know, I was, I'm, I'm pretty emotional today yeah. because I'm here in Los Angeles because our, uh, one of our daughters is graduating from college mm-hmm. in a couple of days. And I am going after our interview to hear her do her final senior performance. Ah, beautiful. And it's a full circle moment because I'm going to the theater where she got her invitation to audition to even be admitted into the program. Wow. And I've been calling it a full circle moment. Mm. But what I realize is it's a homecoming. It is. And I guess Mm. that's where I want to start. Because It makes me emotional to think about this because I lived for so long feeling what you would call psychologically homeless. Yes. Disconnected from my true self. Mm -hmm. And the feeling that you have when you finally feel whole, it is unlike anything I've ever experienced. Yes. And I appreciate 
the honesty and the transparency because we do get disconnected. You know, life disconnects us. And, you know, if you don't mind saying, how could you tell you were disconnected or what was it like when you were psychologically wandering? It felt like there was the physical me mm -hmm. walking around in my life doing the things that we all do, getting yeah. up, going to work, mm -hmm. taking care of the kids, calling friends, mm -hmm. watching TV. But there was a part of me that was separate, yeah. that felt, um, I guess you could call it like a knowing. Mm. I, I wonder if even that critical voice that we listen to is also almost like grinding at you because you're not really on a path where you feel like you are truly, I mean, and sometimes I think back, I think I, I didn't even feel like I was alive for crying mm -hmm. out loud, mm -hmm. just on autopilot, just yeah. feeling no spiritual center, yes. no connection to values, just existing. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it would be for me, this feeling of separateness. Mm. Yeah separated from yourself and then separated from other people because you're surrounded by people, but they don't really see, you know, you can fool a lot of people, including yourself. Right. So a part of when I talk about homecoming is telling yourself the truth and then living based on that truth that you tell yourself. Mm. Right. Because I can lie to myself that social script is, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> and, you know, I'm in a lot of faith-based communities and the term is like, I'm blessed, right? It's like, yeah, you can be blessed and also have a lot going on. Yeah. Uh, blessed and lost. So uh, that awakening, what I like to say, and I think I say it in the book is, can we get to the place where we can admit I miss myself? Wow. Okay, I just want to make sure mm -hmm. that you listening to us just got what Dr. Tama just said to you. I miss myself. Yeah. How yeah. does somebody who feels like they don't even know who they are, like mm -hmm. you hear that a lot, I don't even know who I am anymore. Yes, yeah. So I like to say, even if you feel like you were never at home with yourself, you can still come home to yourself. And that is the reality for a lot of people who grew up with stress and trauma, mm -hmm. who perhaps were born into families where there was a lot of stress and trauma. So you learned early to be in survival mode, or you learned to play small, or you learned to people please. And so you never got to what I like to call unfold, right? You never got to connect with the truth of who you are. And so even if you have never met you, you can come home to you. And that's kind of the good news of this process. Wow. There's a West African uh, fable yeah. that you tell at the very beginning of the yes. book that I think will give us a visual mm -hmm. and a story to lock on to that we can keep coming back to to yes. help keep people in the conversation. Yeah. So would you mind telling us oh, that? that I, what is it? Is it a fable? Yes. What do you? Yeah, you can say it's a, a fable. I um, I lived in Liberia, West Africa for high school. So I'm going to do it in my version of Liberian English. But any Liberians who are listening will tell you, <laughs> oh, that's not the for true. <laughs> uh, so um, once upon a time, once upon a time in West Africa, there was one animal expert. And this animal expert knew every animal that was in the bush. You people say forest, but the real word is bush. If he see giraffe, he know the thing giraffe. If he see lion, he know the thing lion. So this animal expert is walking one day, so, 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 and he goes behind one farm. And he's passing the farm, and behind the farm, he sees so, so, so chickens. In the middle of the chickens is one eagle. <laughs> he said, what are the eagle doing with these chickens? He goes to the front of the farm, and he say, bop, bop. You people say knock, knock, the real sound, that's bop, bop. <laughs> he say, bop, bop. The man inside say, who that? The man outside say, that me. You must open the door and see. So he opens the door. He say, what well, your business here? He say, in the back of your farm, you got so, so, so chickens. But in the middle, it's one eagle. The farmer laughed. He said, no, I only have chicken. The animal expert said, I'll show you. They go to the back of the farm. 
He picks up the one he's calling an eagle. He puts it on his arm. He says, listen to me. You're not chicken. Chickens can't fly. You can fly. Go ahead and fly. The eagle listened to him, but then he looked down at his chicken brothers and sisters eating their chicken food. He jumped down off the man's arm, and he'd go back with the chickens. The farmer starts laughing at the animal expert. The animal expert is vexed. Eh? He said, I coming to go. He storm away. The next day, he come back. He comes so soon in the morning, God himself was not awake yet. Eh? He come, he say what? Bop, bop. The man inside say, who that? The man outside say, that me. Open the door and see. He opens the door. He takes him. He says, what are you doing here? He said, I came here because you have one eagle. This time he took the eagle and he climbed to the roof of the barn. They get to the top of the barn. And at that moment, the sun started to rise. <laughs> the animal expert says to the eagle, all your life, people told you you were a chicken. They told you talk like chicken, act like chicken, walk like chicken, but you're not a chicken, you're an eagle. Mm. The eagle said to himself, I think if I don't try this thing, this man will come every day bothering me. Maybe today I will try it. So he spread his wings and he started to fly. And I tell you, my eyes could never see him again. And that's the whole reason why you and I are here today, because there are those who are listening who have been treated like chickens, dating like chickens, picking jobs like chickens. But you're not a chicken. You're an eagle. So fly. Oh, I just got to <laughs> do that right now. Oh, my gosh. Uh, that, that is why this book is required reading mm. for everyone. This is why you wrote the book. In fact, yeah. I would love for you to read this part. Right here, up to there. Oh, sure. The eagle made it home. He made it to the truth of who he was. This is homecoming. I wrote this book for all of you who at different points in your life have found yourself living like someone you are not. You may have started acting different because of how you were treated or what other people told you about yourself or how you saw others acting. You have not felt comfortable or safe enough to truly be yourself or to feel at home in your identity. The recognized and unrecognized traumas of your past may have taught you to hide your gifts and voice in order to survive. This book facilitates your journey back to who you really are so you can own your full identity and fly. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. And it has been such a gift being able to get this out to people because so many of us are hungry for more. Like you have the sense this can't be it, mm. right? Like this, mm -hmm. this just can't be it, right? In whatever area of my life. And so uh, to know that healing is work, but we're worth it, mm. right? Yeah. And when we are not at home, we're paying a cost anyway. How much has it cost me to live some other woman's life? Ah, <sighs> I don't want to pay it anymore. Yeah. 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 It costs you your life. Right. It costs you your life. Absolutely. So let's walk through the process of okay. homecoming. Yes. I'm an eagle in mm -hmm. disguise as a chicken. Right. I come in yeah. and I want to begin this journey. Mm -hmm. And I have the honor of sitting down across from you, yeah. Dr. Tama. Yes. But I don't know I'm an eagle. Right. When, every, when any patient comes in and sits mm -hmm. down that you work with, are you like, oh, we got another eagle mm -hmm. who's, in a, who's in a chicken suit right now? Right. Yeah. <laughs> How do we start? Like, what, where yes. is the beginning yes. step yeah. to your own homecoming? I start every session with the breath. Okay. Because we're so busy and scattered, and we have been tricked, duped, hoodwinked into believing I can prove my worthiness with my busyness. And so people can come in, you know, running a million miles and have believed themselves that if I'm so productive, 
I must be at home. Mm. But we often are not. And so I invite people to take a moment to tune into their breath, to inhale in through the nose, and exhale out through the mouth, and to begin to scan their bodies, noticing any place where you're holding tension and sending breath throughout the body, giving yourself permission to breathe and release. As we set intentions for self-compassion and for clarity. And that's how we begin. I feel different. Yeah, right? Tell me the different. What did you notice? Um, I just noticed that my mind went quiet. Mm -hmm. And I dropped out of my head yeah. and into my body. That's it. And there was a slowing mm. that kind of went with this knowing right. that this feels better yeah. than the thoughts that are racing mm -hmm. or the things that are on my mind mm -hmm. or the sound that is distracting me, that it feels yeah. better. Yeah. What's it feel like for you? Right. It is the, uh, the homecoming that I, and that's a part of the closing our eyes or lowering our gaze, is when we're... Uh, open, we're open to all the stimulation around us. Mm. And especially if you're uh, a, a trauma survivor, you are tuned into other people, right? So what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What do they need? It's dangerous to relax it is. when you're a victim of trauma and yeah. discrimination and yes. violence. Yeah. Then truth shows up, right? And many of us suppress and run and hide. And so then that heightens the belief that I can't see myself, mm. right? And so that keeps us running. So instead, to give people permission and with the support, because they're not having to face it by themselves, I'm with them for us to actually tune in to what's going on in there and uh, to start to look at what are the signs of my disconnection. So that's where the journey begins for us to notice Right? Where is my disconnection showing up in me? So if homecoming means coming back home and feeling connected yeah. to your most authentic self, right. to recognizing the eagle yes. that is in there, yes, and ignoring what mm -hmm. everybody said and all the stuff around you that makes you chicken, right. makes you feel like a chicken, right. what are the signs yes. of disconnection? So when we are in a place of feeling powerless, hopelessness, uh, despair, those are indicators that we have lost sight of our power and voice. Because mm. the truth is we do have capacity, voice, and agency, but we've been in environments where that wasn't welcomed or that wasn't responded to, and so then that can leave us feeling like we're empty. And there's a story you tell in the book yeah. about um, being at a event where you're giving one of the bazillion keynote speeches that you give, <laughs> yes. and a survivor mm -hmm. of sexual abuse comes up to you. Can yeah. you share that story? Yes. Yeah. So I was speaking at a conference uh, on sexual assault, and I'm a sexual assault survivor. And I give the presentation, and when it's over, people are responding really well. And then I'm standing there in this line, which I know you are used to. And there's a long line of people waiting to kind of share their, their response or their connection to what you said. And uh, I see toward the back of the line uh, this woman who we would say had a, had a bad attitude, right? Mm. But I know attitude is despair. But uh, Hold on a second. Uh-huh. Attitude is despair? Yeah. So a form of depression people often don't recognize is irritable depression. Right? Yeah. Wow. And and people don't respond to compassion with compassion to women with a quote-unquote bad attitude. But if we said, when I see that woman, she's in despair, maybe then I would respond with compassion. Mm. But some of us, by family, by culture, by religion, were taught that sadness is weakness. So we mask our sadness with anger, with bitterness, with attitude, right? But underneath it is the despair. 
it's so true. Yeah. It's like an iceberg. You see the anger on the top, uh-huh. but there's something so much so deeper going on. So much deeper underneath. Wow. Yeah. So you could pick up on the attitude and the energy. Mm-hmm. But I know there's the story there. Yeah. Right? Especially because when you know you haven't done anything, right? Mm. So I am I am feeling on the receiving end of your upset, and I haven't done anything so that I know there's a story. Yeah. So, you know, when it gets to be her place, uh, she's next in the line. And she says to me with the attitude, um, so you're a survivor? And I said, look, I just gave a whole keynote on it, right? (laughs) I say yes. And she says, well, you don't look like any survivor I've ever known. So the doubting can be triggering as we think about not being believed. Mm. But then I go deeper than that. Uh, and decide not to get defensive. Instead, I just let her question slash statement hang in the air, and I just, uh, what I would say, soften, Hmm. right? I soften, and I just look at her, and it's like now she can see me. Like on the stage with my PowerPoint and my pantsuit, she she couldn't see me, right? She could only see the strength and the... Uh, oratorical skills, yeah. but now standing in front of her, kind of woman to woman, she could see uh, the vulnerability. Hmm. And seeing the vulnerability, she said, you know, the only survivors I've ever known were uh, fat and uh, poor like me. Right. So then it's the different ways our surviving shows up. And for some of us who are often overlooked, we coped with busyness and with what I would call a spirit of excellence. And when you are excellent, people don't notice your wounds. Hmm. And sometimes you don't notice them. You feel you've outrun it. Yes. But it's there late at night. Early in the morning, when you're in certain environments, it shows up that it's still bleeding and you've just gotten busy but not healed. What's the difference? I guess, what is healing? Yeah. So it is the homecoming of being accepting and loving of myself. When I Except me, I have nothing to prove. There's a uh, life coach here in in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come I'm gonna give you her name later, <laughs> but she has a beautiful quote I love, which is, uh, "I don't want to be driven. I want to be called." And this idea of like when you're driven, your trauma can drive you. Yeah. Like your insecurity can, you know, where you have to constantly prove yourself and it's this franticness versus when I'm at home, then I can be in flow with what is me. Yeah. Wow. Um, if you have somebody in your life who has that irritable depression, yeah. Mm-hmm. how do you practice softening Yes. And compassion. Because oftentimes if you're around somebody who's constantly irritable, mm-hmm. who is always angry about or frustrated with something, yeah. I have several people that come to mind right mm-hmm. now in my own life. Yeah. What are some some tools mm-hmm. that we can use right. to practice more compassion in those moments so yeah. that we lead with compassion rather yeah. than get so reactive? Right. And I love that question because I think what we often get pulled into is being combative with them Mm -hmm. and they're always going to out combat us (laughs) (laughs) because they're in warrior mode. Right. Right. And so, uh, you know, when they come with the intensity, uh, then I respond to the softness. And I would say one of two ways. One is if I if I can relate at all, I'll give my own experience. Right. And that helps them not to feel judged. Right. I'm not saying like calling you out because I see what you're doing. 
It's just saying, you know, there was a time where, and whatever that story is, and often I, I have learned transparency is contagious. Mm. And sometimes then people say, oh, me too, right? right. And I'm like, yeah, you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you too. <laughs> uh, so the testimonial or if I know anything that's been happening in their life, to name that, to say, because they're responding with all this intensity about distraction. Right. So then I will say, um, well, I really wanted to check in because I know this is such a busy time with you, you know, that you're moving, that you're this, that you're that. And for us to ask a deeper question, because the how are you gives us finding you. Yeah. Right. So break out of the script. And so instead, with everything you're holding, you know, what's been helping you to manage, right? Or what do you need? Or how can I help? Yeah. Um, so I'm speaking to the unspoken. If you bring in the chicken and the eagle, mm -hmm. can we use that that fable to describe that moment where mm -hmm. the survivor in the audience yeah. has this irritable, depressive moment with you? Right. What is happening for her in your opinion mm -hmm. as a psychologist? Yeah. So I like to say the reason you feel unsettled is because you're not supposed to settle. Say that again. The reason you feel unsettled is because you're not supposed to settle. So what area of your life are you settling? And I would imagine that any area where you feel unsettled. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> there, there it is. There, there it is. is. So, you know, what happens is often we are focused so much uh, outwardly, if only. If only my spouse would do this. If only my kids would do this. If only my supervisor would do this. Um, and in this moment, we don't have the capacity to shift them. So how might you want to shift? Right. That's a big ask because mm -hmm. it's easier to try to order everybody else oh, around yes. your life. And frustrating and yes. annoying and, yes. and draining, but it also uh, lets me off the hook because I can keep waiting for their homecoming, right? I can come home to myself when they come home to themselves. Well, everybody is on their own timing, and what I like to remind myself is I don't want to be... I don't want to keep my healing hostage waiting for the healing of those who harmed me. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing when we're like waiting for the apology. Yeah. It's like, I can't heal till you see what you did to me. Yes. Like that could be years. It might be your whole life. It may be your whole life. Right. They have gone on with their lives. They don't care. They're not thinking about it. And so I want to take my healing out of their hands. Mm. And give it back to yourself. Yeah. And so the process of coming home and the homecoming is yes. the act of self-healing. Yes. It's yes. about joining back in with yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, because we have such a huge international audience and therapy can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to um, read these six questions that you often ask patients. Yeah that can be a sign of what you call psychological homelessness. Mm -hmm. And so I would also love for you, Dr. Tama, to talk about what is psychological homelessness. Yeah. I've never heard that phrase before, yeah. but it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, psychological homelessness is this sense of wandering, being ungrounded, unrooted, confused. And we can spend years saying, I don't know, I'm not sure. And even when I'm waiting for other people to give me the answer, then they're my compass. But I need a compass. Hmm. That's what we talk about with therapy is at some point people need to internalize it. So it's not just every week people coming and saying, so Tama, what do you think? Yeah. Right. They have to get to the point where I was having this conversation with my sister and I realized I was doing this. And so I, sh well, there it is. Right now you have become your compass, right? So here are the questions. Does the state of your life internally or externally 
fall short of what you imagined? Did you attain what you thought you wanted only to discover that you still feel empty and unfulfilled? Do you have a sense of powerlessness or hopelessness? Do you lack the energy or motivation to pursue the things that used to matter to you? Do you feel there are no words to capture the ache in your heart? Do you find yourself crying often or does it seem impossible to cry? If somebody resonates mm -hmm. with any of those questions, yeah. What should they do? Yes. So I want to first say to anyone who connected with those, you've taken the first step, which is awareness. Because I can't come home to myself if I don't realize I'm wandering. Yeah. Right? Sometimes we don't realize it. You can, time is passing and you don't know it. Mm. So the fact that in this moment, as you're listening, you chose to tell yourself the truth. That is your mind, heart, body, spirit telling to you, we're ready, right? Because when we don't feel ready, you know, we, we're uh, distracting ourselves, we're busying ourselves, and then truth so shows up. So telling yourself the truth is the first step. And then we think about both self-care and community care. And sometimes when we don't feel good about ourselves, uh, we neglect ourselves and we erase ourselves. And that those can have cultural messages and gender messages and religious messages where people will say self-care is selfish. Right. You know? And so to say uh, to myself, I am not just a tool for other people's nourishing. I am not just a pathway for other people to get goodness in life that I too am a living soul that is deserving of the goodness that I want other people to experience. And so it is a sacred act to begin to care for ourselves. And the catch is when we talk about behavioral psychology, with behavioral psychology, you start to do the action even if you don't feel it yet, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So if I say, like, I'm going to wait till I have high self-esteem and then take good care of myself, like, it's not going to work. Right. So I have to start doing it even when I don't feel it. Yes. Right? Yes. What do you, like, I keep, the word that keeps coming to mind is purpose. So you hear a lot of people say, I don't know what my purpose is. I, I, I need to find a purpose. Is that a code word for I am disconnected from myself? That is definitely a code word, and the name came back to me of the life coach I quoted. So I just want to give sure. Shannon Yvette okay. is the one who, who gave the quote I said earlier. But uh, when people don't have a sense of their purpose, uh, that's a, an indication of disconnection. I also want to say when we are in unhealthy relationships and on toxic jobs, in order to survive those, you have to disconnect. Mm. It's impossible to be at home with yourself and stay in relationship with someone who is dishonoring you perpetually. Wow. Yeah. So for somebody that just had like, yes, a wake up call. Mm -hmm. Then you can have compassion for yourself because people will judge you and say, like, why would you stay so long? Right but you weren't connected to you. You had been disconnected from yourself, so you don't even feel the capacity to dream again, to imagine, to believe that better is possible for you and that you are deserving of it and worthy of it. I, we see this both in relationships and jobs all the time. All in fact, the time. you have a whole chapter yes. about how to handle a toxic work environment. That's right. So if somebody is listening to this and they're on their way in mm -hmm. to a job that is slowly just draining their soul, right. the first step is to acknowledge it Yeah. and to recognize that you're disconnected from yourself mm -hmm. and you already gave us the way that you would know. Right. Any area that you are unsettled in mm -hmm. that does not feel cohesive, yeah. that is is where you're settling. That That's is right. a point of disconnection. Mm -hmm. You talk to us about breathing. Yeah. 
close your eyes, come back into your body. Mm -hmm. You've talked also about self-care. What does that mean, self-care? Yeah. So self-care is nourishing every part of yourself. So there is the physical part. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it is hard to heal and come home to yourself if you're living out of vending machines and drive through windows. Why? Because your food affects your mood. And there's nothing life-giving in fake food. (laughs) So uh, as I I like to say, as your grandmother would say, like uh, put some vegetables on that plate, put some greens on that plate. Uh, So fruit and vegetables, I like to think of before I eat something, can I say I'm eating this because I love myself? Hmm. Then some things I won't be able to put in my body because I actually want to live. And we have it flipped where we will call those things the treat. I am treating myself by giving myself something that's killing me. So to have to flip it. And of course, in moderation, because when people hear that, they're like, do you mean I can never have, right? <laughs> so in my, and drinking water instead of all the soda, sleep is a big one. It is hard to come home to yourself when you're exhausted. You know, we are busy, busy, uh, and then all night people are uh, on their phones or, you know, up and can't sleep. And I say, if your idea, and and hopefully this is okay to say. You can say whatever you (laughs) want. Yes. If your idea of relaxing before you go to sleep is watching three episodes of Law & Order, I would encourage you to think about why is trauma relaxing to me? Oh, that's what it is. I mean, it's harm, crime, violation, attacks, and that's what is going to soothe me into my bedtime. So what is the answer yeah. that a lot of people give you when they do go into therapy yeah. about that connection? It's that it's normal and familiar. Some of us grew up in high stress, so we think calmness is either fake or boring. Wow. Right? People mistake peace for boring. (laughs) And it's like to come home to yourself, you have to lean into the discomfort because it's going to feel unfamiliar. I was working with a client, uh, an adult woman and her mom, and they had been disconnected um, because the mother dealt with addiction and didn't raise her, but they are reconnected now and living together. And the adult daughter really wanted her mom to say she loves her. And the mother uh, just said uh, to me, that just seems fake. So she had not grown up with that, had not heard it. To her, it's like something people do on TV. And so I said to her, if you mean it, it's not fake. It just feels like it because you're not used to saying it. Hmm. It is amazing how many people don't tell the people Mm -hmm. that they love that they don't, that they love them. Right. And it hadn't occurred to me, it's because they never were told that themselves. Yeah. And that it might feel forced Mm -hmm. or not authentic. Yes. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the importance of us learning the, each other's love languages because, you know, her response was the response of probably many of her generation, which was you had food on the table or you have a roof yes. over your head. Yes. What more do you want from right. me? Right. What more? What more? Um, I love also that homecoming is not only therapy, mm-hmm. that there is a deeply spiritual aspect to this. Yes. So what is sort of the, how would you describe the difference between therapy Mm -hmm. and spirituality and the work that you need to do in both areas? That's right. So unfortunately, many people who are in the mental health field did not get trained to incorporate spirituality. Mm. And so uh, there's research that shows on average, mental health professionals endorse a lower level of spirituality or religiosity than the general public. Really? Yes. Why do you think that is? Well, I think uh, a part of that can go with uh, higher levels of education that a lot of times 
people can disconnect as with education can feel like they need to prove everything. Mm. And spirituality is beyond our proving or our being able to, um, to, to manipulate it. Right. So it's like, it's, it's not concrete. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's in the field of psychology, the actual, you know, the founders in the field were often people of faith. But then there was this move in the field where we wanted to prove we're a science. Mm. So if we, we're not, if we want to prove that we're a science, then we can't talk about anything people find spooky or soft or, you know, in some other realm. And so uh, then there has been a neglect from it, from that area. And then I think the other part of it has been um, the recognition that some people have been harmed in spiritual spaces. Mm. So then some therapists will overgeneralize and think that it is all harmful, as opposed to whenever you get people together, you're going to have some good and some bad, some things that are healthy or unhealthy. What is your definition of spirituality? It is an awareness of the sacred beyond what we can see. Oh, I love that definition. Mm. And now that we're on this topic, yeah. it occurs to me, how could you possibly heal mm -hmm. without pulling faith yes. and a belief that something that you have not experienced mm -hmm. is possible? That's it. 100%. Because I even say to be a therapist, social worker, life coach, any of these things, you have to have faith, and for people to show up, there has to be a faith that there can be more than what I have seen mm. and what I have experienced. It's like when I'm counseling people who have only had unhealthy relationships, and I have to say, just because this one is better doesn't mean it's good, right? If you were just used to bad treatment, if people like call you back, you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> right? they call me back. And it's like, that was nice, but there's more, right? Yes. There's more. Yes. Yes. So we've kind of started stepping yeah. toward this awareness. How do you combine the spiritual practice mm -hmm. and the belief in something that you may have never experienced or seen right. with the work to start to heal or, as you say, repair it yourself yeah. in the physical space? That's right. So a part of it is what gives us the motivation to do the work. Because a lot of times we're operating based on evidence, which is what we've seen. Mm -hmm. So if I've only had bad experiences, my parents abandoned me, this person left me, this person mistreated me. If I believe that is all that exists, then the conclusion would be I am unworthy. Right? That's the only possible right conclusion because, you know, this idea, this, you know, victim blaming, self blaming of if I deserved better, I would have received better. And you will hear people blaming other people for being mistreated. You know, they'll say, oh, well, you must have allowed it. And so uh, in order for me to come to a different conclusion that I am worthy of what I have not yet experienced, I have to have the belief of the more. How the heck do you do that when yes. your whole life yeah. you have experienced mm -hmm. either abuse or mistreatment or discrimination yes. or violence? Mm -hmm. How do you, when you have evidence that mm -hmm. does make you feel unworthy, because I'm sure you get these DMs and these emails yes. all day long, so do yeah. we, yeah. of people who so want to believe mm -hmm. that they are worthy, that something is better, that they can change your yeah. life for the better. And you and I can sit where we are and go, of course you can. I right. have just wait. You, I have so much evidence that it's yeah. possible. Yeah. It's both spiritual mm -hmm. and I could argue the case. Yes. Yes. But for somebody mm -hmm. who is sitting in the disbelief. Yeah. How do you cross over? Right. To belief. Yeah. So it's a couple of levels. One of them is to get people to reflect on what do they believe all human beings deserve. Well, I believe I'm a chicken. Right. And all I see are chickens. Well, and I believe I'm on the ground. You know yes, what I'm saying? Like yes, we go back yes, to this. Yes. How do you possibly convince yourself right. that you could be an eagle if you've never seen one? Yes, yes. So what we uh, connect with is disrupting what we call the cognitive distortions. 
So it's not That's just... That's a big word. Yes, what is cognitive right. distortion? So your false thought, the lies. Okay. The lies you told yourself and the lies other people told you. What if... Well, let me give you an example. Okay, please. The lies. So uh, for people who were molested... Yes. They either were told directly or indirectly that that is their fault, right? That um, it's because they developed early or it's because they shouldn't have been over there or whatever it is that somehow that's on you. And so we have to uh, demonstrate that that is a lie. So how do I demonstrate that that is a lie? Does every girl who develops breast early deserve to be molested? Of course not. So you are not an exception to that rule. Oh. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I can see another lie mm -hmm. because I'm a survivor mm -hmm. of uh, that kind of abuse. Yeah. It's the shh. Mm -hmm. Don't tell anyone mm -hmm. or you'll get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. And what I learned about that, uh, I say from my own journey, is I was taught that keeping quiet kept the peace until I realized whose peace is it keeping. Oh. oh. Right? The offender's at peace. The people who don't want to deal with it at peace and I, in this little body, am holding all of the war. So I don't want to hold it anymore. Wow. Yeah. You know, this is what we're taught. You're going to upset things. You're going to upset people. Nobody wants to hear that. And, uh, yeah, there's no peace. Whose peace are you keeping? Yeah. You're making it easy for everybody else mm -hmm. as it's slowly right. destroying you. Absolutely. And often then they're gone. They're doing it to multiple people over the course of years. Uh, be the silence gives freedom to for it to continue. How do you counsel people who, in the process of starting to come back home to themselves, yeah. to learn to fly, mm -hmm. to stop holding the peace for other people around you? How do you counsel people to then go back into their life. Mm -hmm. Like you're, let's just say it's a relationship. Yeah. Where you have somebody that you're dating mm -hmm. or in relationship with yep. and there's alcohol or drugs. Mm -hmm. You've had the conversation. You've gone around and around and around. Yeah. And you're the one that's not saying anything. Mm -hmm. So you're keeping the peace for them. Right. How do you handle like that sort of disruption in your life now yeah. that you're starting to, because it, it's scary. Yes. The homecoming is. process can also be scary because yes. you're going to have to confront things. And it's going to require some losses. And some people are not going to be happy with the new you. People like the silent you. Mm. They like the compliant you. They like the doormat you. Who wouldn't like that? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> so when you start getting some opinions and start getting your voice and not wanting to do some of the unhealthy things you've been doing, uh, not everyone is going to celebrate. And that will be important for you to see who wants me whole and who prefers me broken. And then I will have to start making some adjustments. And there are a range of ways we can do it. So like at, in the work chapter, we say there's one path for if I want to stay on this job and how do I restore myself? And there's another path where I need to leave this job. And in relationship with people, whether romantic or otherwise, uh, some I will have to end and some it will have to be different because I'm different. And uh, there's there can be a grieving there. Wow. You know, in your new role, mm -hmm. you are um, really wanting to bring access to therapy, to mental health support, to the process of a homecoming for people, yeah. um, to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. So why is therapy, what is therapy and why is it important? Yeah. So therapy is when you have uh, trained, licensed 
facilitator who understands how to journey with you from where you are back home to yourself Mm. without judgment and with compassion and without needing you to take care of them. Oh, that last part Mm -hmm. was the big one. That's the big one. That's why your friend is not the same thing. Your family member is not the same thing. Wow. Yeah. I had always said objective and licensed, Mm -hmm. but the fact that you just said, yeah, you don't have to take care of them. That's right. Wow. Yeah. That's the huge part, especially for those of us who have tendencies toward taking care of people. Right? Yeah. So then in your other relationships, you'll say, I don't want to burden people or I know they have a lot going on. So let me just pour into them. Well, this is the space where you don't have to give. You don't have to be on. You don't have to you don't have to do that. You know, I tell my clients, I'm good. Right? <laughs> I have spaces outside of here that are for me. So you don't have to worry. I, I have the capacity to hold it. And and that's what we need. And you also have the tools yes, to help us recognize right. and call ourselves out where we're being a chicken, right? where we could be an eagle, yeah, and how to take flight. And, and I will say um, it is so important to have the tools and the understanding because people who don't will often blame, let's say if you have a child who's depressed and their parents just call them lazy. Yes. Right. They don't understand what they're looking at. And so that's a part of what's important as well is perspective uh, and insight into what I'm seeing. If somebody in your life is struggling, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to send my husband to therapy. Just going to send my kid to therapy. Does that work? So there is a benefit of individual and family. Okay. Right. Because I'll say, especially uh, with children, what I saw when I first started was people would drop off their child and I would spend like an hour building this kid up and then they pick them up and in the parking lot, they're cussing the kid out. Oh, it's like this. Like it did, they didn't even make it home. So like it, it's what are, what, what are we are we just going to do this every week? And so now I'm seeing like what the real dynamic is. So, you know, with couples, um, I will say there is a part of our work that is individual. Let's say if I'm working with a sexual trauma survivor. So there's a part that is that person's journey. But then there's a part for the couple to say, like, what will the intimacy be like for us, given the history? And how do we support Mm. each other Mm -hmm. and have patience with each other? And I want to name as we're talking about people is not only self-care, but community care. Let's talk about that. What does that even mean? Yeah. So we heal in relationship to other people. There is something very liberating and healing in being known, like you reveal yourself and people still love you, right? That people still choose you, that people, uh, that you feel seen and heard and supported. Uh, There's emotional social support which is like someone I can cry with, yeah. someone I can share my good news with, someone who I can vent to. Uh, but then there's also instrumental social support. Are there people who can help me in concrete, practical ways? And it's important that we know which friend or family member is good at what, right? You may have a relative who's not touchy-feely, right? <laughs> They're not good with the tears, but they can help you find a job, right? So that's another type of support. Yeah. For... I'm I'm surprised and saddened by the number of people that will reach out when they hear you say that yeah. and say, I have no one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you have somebody that you are working with yeah. who is telling themselves the story yeah. that I have no one, mm-hmm. what are the rituals or the tools or the tactics? Because you give homework in this yes. world. Every chapter has homework. That's right. I would imagine every counseling session mm-hmm. that you do as a yeah. therapist, has homework. Yeah. So what would the homework be if you're somebody who says, I have no one? Then one of our goals will be to make friends and at first get their buy-in. Can we say that that's a goal for you is to make friends? And so then we have to think about where are we going to get these friends? Sometimes it's brand new people. 
Um, so it may be you sign up for a cooking class or you join a book club or you join a political organization or your yoga group. Uh, and then sometimes you have people, but you have kept it very surface. Mm. So then I want to deepen my relationships. And the Surgeon General has been talking recently and issued the advisory about yep. loneliness. Yep. And what I like to tell people is loneliness is nothing to be ashamed of. Some people, when they hear you say you're lonely, they just say you need to love yourself. And I like to say that's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can love yourself and still desire a connection to other people. So uh, that is not an automatic absence of self-love. And so then uh, if I have acquaintances that are all very surface, then to deepen it, am I willing to go deeper? Because, again, I can start to shift the tide when I talk about deeper things, then other people will often meet me there. Wow. And what about, you talked, we just touched on this, and I know so many people do not like what they do for a living. Yeah. And in the book, you write about having a job that was very toxic. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what it felt like to walk into work and how you practice a homecoming yeah. when you're in a toxic environment? Yes. Uh, it is so uh, stressful in your body, in your mind. And that's even before you can do your work, right? Just the, True. the, <laughs> the, the Sunday setting. scaries, the driving oh, in, the dreading oh, it. It's, it's terrible. And so then, of course, you can't flow in a spirit of excellence because you're, you know, battling all of these other dynamics. And so I like to encourage people to create a morning ritual so that you show up with your cup already full. So can you give us an example? Yeah. What does that mean? Yes. So first of all, wake up before you have to get up. Okay. What does that mean? That means don't set your alarm for the time you have to jump out of bed and jump in the shower because now you've already started your day frantic. Yes. So now I'm going into a toxic place already feeling anxious. Okay. So you want to wake up a little bit earlier and then figure out what are the practices that would nourish me. For some people, that will be listening to music. I like to say, in every season of your life, come up with your theme song. Yep. So your theme song will get you in the right mindset, uh, doing some stretching next to the bed, body movement, exercise. Some people go for early morning walk, so then they already feel settled and slowed down. Uh, meditation and or prayer, uh, reading something uh, inspirational. Can And that can kind of create the mantra for your day. Why does this matter? You know, because yeah. when somebody's like, you have no idea. I have this abusive boss and these jerks that I work with and I yeah. can't quit and I've got bills to play. Don't sit here, Dr. Mm -hmm. Tama, and yes. tell me that I should... I should freaking stretch. Yes. Go for a walk. Mm -hmm. Are you a crazy woman? Yeah. Like, why does this matter? I want to introduce you to the part of you that is not an employee. You are more than your labor. Oh. Yeah. So if we center our full session every week on your boss, then all you are is your boss's worker. And there is a you beyond your boss. Wow. Is that true about mm -hmm. being in a bad relationship yes. too? Yeah. That... Uh, they they consume a lot of your energy and time, yeah. but you were a person before you met them. And whether this continues or not, you're going to be a person. And we want to meet that person. We mm. want to nourish that person because there is more to you than what they see. And a part of what they're responding to is they see the vastness of you and don't like it. You end every therapy session mm -hmm. and every chapter of the book the same way. And you also end every episode of the Homecoming podcast yeah. the same way. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have you, to invite you yeah. to end our conversation with it. Beautiful. I invite your soul to tell your heart, mind, body and spirit welcome home mm. dr tama bryant you are a gift from god
to all of us. Mm. Oh, thank you so much. And I want each of you who are listening to know you're worthy of the journey home. Mm. Dr. Tama, that is such a beautiful vision, helping all of us to be the light posts along the way to get each other home. If I really stop and think about it, one of the reasons why I always end my episodes with the same sentiment every single time is because I'm trying to help you return home to yourself. That's why I always remind you that I love you and I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to create a better life and find your way back home to yourself. Oh, one more thing. It's the legal language. This podcast is presented solely for educational and entertainment purposes. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.